This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 6 Water, Water Two hours later, that is, about four o'clock, I woke up, for so soon as the first heavy demand of bodily fatigue had been satisfied, the torturing thirst from which I was suffering asserted itself. I could sleep no more. I had been dreaming that I was bathing in a running stream, with green banks and trees upon them, and I awoke to find myself in this arid wilderness, and to remember, as Umbopa had said, that if we did not find water this day we must perish miserably. No human creature could live long without water in that heat. I sat up and rubbed my grimy face with my dry and horny hands, as my lips and eyelids were stuck together, and it was only after some friction and with an effort that I was able to open them. It was not far from dawn, but there was none of the bright feel of dawn in the air, which was thick with a hot murkiness that I cannot describe. The others were still sleeping. Presently it began to grow light enough to read, so I drew out a little pocket copy of the Ingoldsby Legends, which I had brought with me, and read The Jackdaw of Reims. When I got to where a nice little boy held a golden ewer, embossed and filled with water as pure as any that flows between Reims and Namur. Literally, I smacked my cracking lips, or rather tried to smack them. The mere thought of that pure water made me mad. If the cardinal had been there with his bell, book, and candle, I would have whipped in and drunk his water up. Yes, even if he had filled it already with the suds of soap, worthy of washing the hands of the Pope, and I knew that the whole consecrated curse of the Catholic Church should fall upon me for so doing. I almost think that I must have been a little light-headed with thirst, weariness, and the want of food, for I fell to thinking how astonished the Cardinal and his nice little boy and the jackdaw would have looked to see a burnt-up, brown-eyed, grizzly-haired little elephant hunter suddenly bound between them, put his dirty face into the basin and swallow every drop of the precious water. The idea amused me so much that I laughed, or rather cackled aloud, which woke the others, and they began to rub their dirty faces and drag their gummed-up lips and eyelids apart. As soon as we were all well awake, we began to discuss the situation, which was serious enough. Not a drop of water was left. We turned the bottles upside down and licked the tops, but it was a failure. They were dry as a bone. Good, who had charge of the flask of brandy, got it out and looked at it longingly. But Sir Henry promptly took it away from him, for to drink raw spirit would only have been to precipitate the end. If we do not find water, we shall die, he said. If we can trust to the old Dom's map, there should be some about, I said, but nobody seemed to derive much satisfaction from this remark. It was so evident that no great faith could be put in the map. Now it was gradually growing light, and as we sat staring blankly at each other, I observed the Hottentot Ventvogel rise and begin to walk about with his eyes on the ground. Presently he stopped short, and uttering a guttural exclamation, pointed to the earth. "'What is it?' we exclaimed, and rising simultaneously, we went to where he was standing, staring at the sand. "'Well,' I said, "'it is fresh springbok spore. What of it?' "'Springboks do not go far from water,' he answered in Dutch. "'No,' I answered, "'I forgot, and thank God for it. This little discovery put new life into us, for it is wonderful when a man is in a desperate position how he catches at the slightest hope and feels almost happy. On a dark night, a single star is better than nothing. 
Meanwhile, Ventvogel was lifting his snub nose and sniffing the hot air for all the world like an old Impala ram who scents danger. Presently he spoke again. I smell water, he said. Then we fell quite jubilant, for we knew what a wonderful instinct these wild-bred men possess. Just at that moment the sun came up gloriously, and revealed so grand a sight to our astonished eyes that for a moment or two we even forgot our thirst. There, not more than forty or fifty miles from us, glittering like silver in the early rays of the morning sun, soared Sheba's breasts, and stretching away for hundreds of miles on either side of them, ran the great Suleiman Berg. Now that sitting here I attempt to describe the extraordinary grandeur and beauty of that sight, language seems to fail me. I am impotent even before its memory. Straight before us rose two enormous mountains, the likes of which are not, I believe, to be seen in Africa, if indeed there are any other such in the world, measuring each of them at least 15,000 feet in height standing not more than a dozen miles apart, linked together by a precipitous cliff of rock, and towering in awful white solemnity straight into the sky. These mountains placed thus, like the pillars of a gigantic gateway, are shaped after the fashion of a woman's breasts, and at times the mists and shadows beneath them take the form of a recumbent woman, veiled mysteriously in sleep. Their bases swell gently from the plain, looking at that distance perfectly round and smooth, and upon the top of each is a vast hillock covered with snow exactly corresponding to the nipple on the female breast. The stretch of cliff that connects them appears to be some thousands of feet in height, and perfectly precipitous, and on each flank of them, so far as the eye can reach, extent similar lines of cliff, broken only here and there by flat table-topped mountains, something like the world famed one at Cape Town, a formation, by the way, that is very common in Africa. To describe the comprehensive grandeur of that view is beyond my powers. There was something so inexpressibly solemn and overpowering about those huge volcanoes, for doubtless they are extinct volcanoes, that it quite awed us. For a while the morning lights played upon the snow and the brown and swelling masses beneath, and then, as though to veil the majestic sight from our curious eyes, strange vapors and clouds gathered and increased around the mountains, till presently we could only trace their pure and gigantic outlines, showing ghost-like through the fleecy envelope. Indeed, as we afterwards discovered, usually they were wrapped in this gauze-like mist, which doubtless accounted for our not having seen them more clearly before. Sheba's breasts had scarcely vanished into cloud-clad privacy before our thirst, literally a burning question, reasserted itself. It was all very well for Ventvogel to say that he smelt water, but we could see no signs of it, look which way we would. So far as the eye might reach, there was nothing but arid, sweltering sand and Karoo scrub. We walked round the hillock and gazed about anxiously on the other side, but it was the same story, not a drop of water could be found. There was no indication of a pan, a pool, or a spring. You are a fool, I said angrily to Ventvogel. There is no water. But still he lifted his ugly snub nose, sniffed. I smell it, boss, he answered. It is somewhere in the air. Yes, I said, no doubt it is in the clouds, and about two months hence it will fall and wash our bones. Sir Henry stroked his yellow beard thoughtfully. Perhaps it is on the top of the hill, he suggested. Rot, said Good. Who ever heard of water being found at the top of a hill? Let us go and look, I put in, and hopelessly enough we scrambled up the sandy sides of the hillock, Umbopa leading. 
Presently he stopped as though he was petrified. Manzi, Manzi, that is, here is water, he cried with a loud voice. We rushed up to him, and there, sure enough, in a deep cut or indentation on the very top of the sand copy, was an undoubted pool of water. How it came to be in such a strange place we did not stop to inquire, nor did we hesitate at its black and unpleasant appearance. It was water or a good imitation of it, and that was enough for us. We gave a bound and a rush, and in another second we were all down on our stomachs, "'sucking up the uninviting fluid as though it were nectar fit for the gods. "'Heavens, how we did drink! "'Then when we had done drinking, we tore off our clothes and sat in the pool, "'absorbing the moisture through our parched skins. "'You, Harry, my boy, who have only to turn a couple of taps "'to summon hot and cold from an unseen, vasty cistern, "'can have little idea of the luxury of that muddy wallow,' in brackish, tepid water. After a while we rose from it, refreshed indeed, and fell to on our biltong, of which we had scarcely been able to touch a mouthful for twenty-four hours, and ate our fill. Then we smoked a pipe, and lay down by the side of that blessed pool, under the overhanging shadow of its bank, and slept till noon. All that day we rested there by the water, thanking our stars that we had been lucky enough to find it, bad as it was, and not forgetting to render a due share of gratitude to the shade of the long-departed da Silvestra, who had set its position down so accurately on the tail of his shirt. The wonderful thing to us was that the pan should have lasted so long, and the only way in which I can account for this is on the supposition that it is fed by some spring deep down in the sand. Having filled both ourselves and our water bottles as full as possible, in far better spirits we started off again with the moon. That night we covered nearly five and twenty miles, but needless to say found no more water, though we were lucky enough the following day to get a little shade behind some ant heaps. When the sun rose and for a while cleared away the mysterious mists, Suleiman's Berg, with the two majestic breasts, now only about twenty miles off, seemed to be towering right above us, and looked grander than ever. At the approach of evening, we marched again, and to cut a long story short, by daylight next morning, found ourselves upon the lowest slopes of Sheba's left breast, for which we had been steadily steering. By this time our water was exhausted once more, and we were suffering severely from thirst, nor indeed could we see any chance of relieving it till we reached the snow line far, far above us. After resting an hour or two, driven to it by our torturing thirst, we went on, toiling painfully in the burning heat up the lava slopes, for we found that the huge base of the mountain was composed entirely of lava beds belched from the bowels of the earth in some far past age. By eleven o'clock we were utterly exhausted and generally speaking in a very bad state indeed. The lava clinker over which we must drag ourselves, though smooth compared with some clinker I have heard of, such as that on the island of Ascension, for instance, was yet rough enough to make our feet very sore, and this, together with our other miseries, had pretty well finished us. A few hundred yards above us were some large lumps of lava, and toward these we steered with the intention of lying down beneath their shade. We reached them, and to our surprise, so far as we had a capacity for surprise left in us, on a little plateau or ridge close by, we saw that the clinker was covered with a dense green growth. Evidently, soil formed of decomposed lava had rested there, and in due course had become the receptacle of seeds deposited by birds. But we did not take much further interest in that green growth, for one cannot live on grass like Nebuchadnezzar. That requires a special dispensation of providence and peculiar digestive organs. 
So we sat down under the rocks and groaned, and for one I wish heartily that we had never started on this fool's errand. As we were sitting there, I saw Umbopa get up and hobble towards the patch of green, and a few minutes afterwards, to my great astonishment, I perceived that usually very dignified individual dancing and shouting like a maniac and waving something green. Off we all scrambled towards him as fast as our wearied limbs would carry us, hoping that he had found water. "'What is it, Umbopa, son of a fool?' I shouted in Zulu. "'It is food and water, Macumazan,' and again he waved the green thing. Then I saw what he had found. It was a melon. We had hit upon a patch of wild melons, thousands of them, and dead ripe. "'Melons!' I yelled to Good, who was next to me, and in another minute his false teeth were fixed in one of them. I think we ate about six each before we had done, and, and poor fruit as they were, I doubt if I ever thought anything nicer. But melons are not very nutritious, and when we had satisfied our thirst with their pulpy substance and put a stock to cool by the simple process of cutting them in two and setting them end on in the hot sun to grow cold by evaporation, we began to feel exceedingly hungry. We had still some biltong left, but our stomachs turned from biltong, and besides, we were obliged to be very sparing of it, for we could not say when we should find more food. Just at this moment, a lucky thing chanced. Looking across the desert, I saw a flock of about ten large birds flying straight towards us. Skit, boss, skit! Shoot, master, shoot, whispered the Hottentot, throwing himself on his face, an example which we all followed. Then I saw that the birds were a flock of pow, or bustards, and that they would pass within fifty yards of my head. Taking one of the repeating Winchesters, I waited till they were very nearly over us, and then jumped to my feet. On seeing me, the pow bunched up together, as I expected that they would, and I fired two shots straight into the thick of them. And as luck would have it, brought down one, a fine fellow that weighed about twenty pounds. In half an hour we had a fire made of dry melon stalks, and he was toasting over it, and we made such a feed as we had not tasted for a week. We ate that pow, nothing was left of him but his leg bones in his beak, and we felt not a little the better afterwards. That night we went on again with the moon, carrying as many melons as we could with us. As we ascended, we found the air grew cooler and cooler, which was a great relief to us, and at dawn, so far as we could judge, we were not more than about a dozen miles from the snow line. Here we discovered more melons, and so had no longer any anxiety about water, for we knew that we should soon get plenty of snow. But the ascent had now become very precipitous, and we made but slow progress, not more than a mile an hour. Also that night we ate our last morsel of biltong. As yet, with the exception of the pow, we had seen no living thing on the mountain, nor had we come across a single spring or stream of water, which struck us as very odd, considering the expanse of snow above us, which must, we thought, melt sometimes. But as we afterwards discovered, owing to a cause which is quite beyond my power to explain, all the streams flowed down upon the north side of the mountain. Now we began to grow very anxious about food. We had escaped death by thirst, but it seemed probable that it was only to die of hunger. The events of the next three miserable days are best described by copying the entries made at the time in my notebook. 21st May. Started 11 a.m., finding the atmosphere quite cold enough to travel by day and carrying some water melons with us, struggled on all day, but found no more melons, having evidently passed out of their district, saw no game of any sort, halted for the night at sundown, having had no food for many hours, suffered much during the night from cold. 22nd. Started at sunrise again, feeling very faint and weak. Only made about five miles all day. 
found some patches of snow of which we ate, but nothing else. Camped at night under the edge of a great plateau. Cold, bitter. Drank a little brandy each and huddled ourselves together, each wrapped up in his blanket, to keep ourselves alive. Are now suffering frightfully from starvation and weariness. Thought that Ventvogel would have died during the night. Twenty-third. Struggled forward once more as soon as the sun was well up and had thawed our limbs a little. We are now in a dreadful plight, and I fear that unless we get food, this will be our last day's journey. But little brandy left. Good Sir Henry and Umbopa bear up wonderfully, but Ventvogel is in a very bad way. Like most Hottentots, he cannot stand cold. Pangs of hunger not so bad, but have a sort of numb feeling about the stomach. Others say the same. We are now on a level with the precipitous chain or wall of lava, linking the two breasts, and the view is glorious. Behind us, the glowing desert rolls away to the horizon, and before us lie mile upon mile of smooth, hard snow, almost level, but swelling gently upwards, out of the center of which the nipple of the mountain, that appears to be some miles in circumference, rises about 4,000 feet into the sky. Not a living thing is to be seen. God help us, I fear that our time has come. And now I will drop the journal, partly because it is not very interesting reading. Also, what follows requires telling rather more fully. All that day, the 23rd May, we struggled slowly up the incline of snow, lying down from time to time to rest. A strange, gaunt crew we must have looked, while, laden as we were, we dragged our weary feet over the dazzling plain, glaring round us with hungry eyes. Not that there was much use in glaring, for we could see nothing to eat. We did not accomplish more than seven miles that day. Just before sunset, we found ourselves exactly under the nipple of Sheba's left breast, which towered thousands of feet into the air, a vast, smooth hillock of frozen snow. Weak as we were, we could not but appreciate the wonderful scene, made even more splendid by the flying rays of light from the setting sun, which here and there stained the snow blood red and crowned the great dome above us with a diadem of glory. I say, gasped Good presently, we ought to be somewhere near that cave the old gentleman wrote about. Yes, said I, if there is a cave. Come, Quartermain, groaned Sir Henry. Don't talk like that. I have every faith in the dom. Remember the water. We shall find the place soon. If we don't find it before dark, we are dead men. That is all about it, was my consolatory reply. For the next ten minutes we trudged in silence, when suddenly Umbopa, who was marching along beside me, wrapped in his blanket, and with a leather belt strapped so tightly round his stomach to make his hunger small, as he said, that his waist looked like a girl's, caught me by the arm. Look, he said, pointing towards the springing slope of the nipple. I followed his glance, and some two hundred yards from us perceived what appeared to be a hole in the snow. "'It is the cave,' said Umbopa. We made the best of our way to the spot, and found sure enough that the hole was the mouth of a cavern, no doubt the same as that of which Da Silvestra wrote. We were not too soon, for just as we reached shelter the sun went down with startling rapidity, leaving the world nearly dark, for in these latitudes there is but little twilight. So we crept into the cave, which did not appear to be very big, and huddling ourselves together for warmth, swallowed what remained of our brandy, barely a mouthful each, and tried to forget our miseries in sleep. But the cold was too intense to allow us to do so, for I am convinced that at this great altitude the thermometer cannot have marked less than 14 or 15 degrees below freezing point. 
what such a temperature meant to us, enervated as we were by hardship, want of food, and the great heat of the desert, the reader may imagine better than I can describe. Suffice it to say that it was something as near death from exposure as I have ever felt. There we sat, hour after hour, through the still and bitter night, feeling the frost wander round and nip us now in the finger, now in the foot, now in the face. In vain we did huddle up closer and closer. There was no warmth in our miserable starved carcasses. Sometimes one of us would drop into an uneasy slumber for a few minutes, but we could not sleep much. And perhaps this was fortunate, for if we had, I doubt if we should have ever woke again. Indeed, I believe that it was only by force of will that we kept ourselves alive at all. Not very long before dawn, I heard the Hottentot Ventvogel, whose teeth had been chattering all night like castanets, give a deep sigh. Then his teeth stopped chattering. I did not think anything of it at the time, concluding that he had gone to sleep. His back was resting against mine, and it seemed to grow colder and colder, till at last it felt like ice. At length the air began to grow gray with light, then golden arrows sped across the snow, and at last the glorious sun peeped above the lava wall and looked in upon our half-frozen forms. Also it looked upon Ventvogel, sitting there amongst us, stone dead. No wonder his back felt cold, poor fellow. He had died when I heard him sigh, and was now frozen almost stiff. Shocked beyond measure, we dragged ourselves from the corpse. How strange is that horror we mortals have of the companionship of a dead body, and left it sitting there, its arms clasped about its knees. By this time the sunlight was pouring its cold rays, for here they were cold, straight into the mouth of the cave. Suddenly I heard an exclamation of fear from someone and turned my head. And this is what I saw. Sitting at the end of the cavern, it was not more than twenty feet deep, was another form, of which the head rested on its chest and the long arms hung down. I stared at it and saw that this too was a dead man, and what was more, a white man. The others saw also and the sight proved too much for our shattered nerves. One and all, we scrambled out of the cave as fast as our half-frozen limbs would carry us. End of chapter 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 7 Solomon's Road Outside the cavern we halted, feeling rather foolish. I am going back, said Sir Henry. Why? asked Good. Because it has struck me that what we saw may be my brother. This was a new idea, and we re-entered the place to put it to the proof. After the bright light outside, our eyes, weak as they were with staring at the snow, could not pierce the gloom of the cave for a while. Presently, however, they grew accustomed to the semi-darkness, and we advanced towards the dead man. Sir Henry knelt down and peered into his face. Thank God, he said with a sigh of relief. It is not my brother. Then I drew near and looked. The body was that of a tall man in middle life with aquiline features, grizzled hair, and a long black mustache. The skin was perfectly yellow and stretched tightly over the bones. Its clothing, with the exception of what seemed to be the remains of a woolen pair of hose, had been removed leaving the skeleton-like frame naked. Round the neck of the corpse, which was frozen perfectly stiff, hung a yellow ivory crucifix. "'Who on earth can it be?' said I. "'Can't you guess?' asked Good. I shook my head. 
"'Why, the old Dom, Jose da Silvestra, of course, who else?' "'Impossible,' I gasped. "'He died three hundred years ago. "'And what is there to prevent him from lasting for three thousand years "'in this atmosphere, I should like to know?' asked Good. "'If only the temperature is sufficiently low, "'flesh and blood will keep fresh as New Zealand mutton forever, "'and heaven knows it is cold enough here. "'The sun never gets in here. "'No animal comes here to tear or destroy. "'No doubt his slave, of whom he speaks on the writing, "'took off his clothes and left him. "'He could not have buried him alone. "'Look,' he went on, "'stooping down to pick up a queerly shaped bone "'scraped at the end into a sharp point. "'Here is the cleft bone that Sylvestra used to draw the map with.' "'We gazed for a moment, astonished, "'forgetting our own miseries in this extraordinary "'and, as it seemed to us, semi-miraculous sight. "'Aye,' said Sir Henry, "'and this is where he got his ink from.' "'and he pointed to a small wound on the Dom's left arm. "'Did ever man see such a thing before? "'There was no longer any doubt about the matter, "'which for my own part, I confess, perfectly appalled me. "'There he sat, the dead man, "'whose directions, written some ten generations ago, "'had led us to this spot, here in my own hand was the rude pen with which he had written them, and about his neck hung the crucifix that his dying lips had kissed. Gazing at him, my imagination could reconstruct the last scene of the drama, the traveler dying of cold and starvation, yet striving to convey to the world the great secret which he had discovered, the awful loneliness of his death, of which the evidence sat before us. It even seemed to me that I could trace in his strongly marked features a likeness to those of my poor friend, Sylvestra, his descendant, who had died twenty years before in my arms. But perhaps that was fancy. At any rate, there he sat, a sad memento of the fate that so often overtakes those who would penetrate into the unknown. And there, doubtless, he will still sit, crowned with the dread majesty of death. For centuries yet unborn, to startle the eyes of wanderers like ourselves, if ever any such should come again to invade his loneliness. The thing overpowered us, already almost perished as we were with cold and hunger. Let us go, said Sir Henry in a low voice. "'Stay, we will give him a companion.' "'And lifting up the dead body of the Hottentot Ventvogel, "'he placed it near to that of the old Dom. "'Then he stooped, and with a jerk broke the rotten string of the crucifix, "'which hung round Da Silvestra's neck, "'for his fingers were too cold to attempt to unfasten it. "'I believe that he has it still. "'I took the bone pen and it is before me as I write. Sometimes I use it to sign my name. Then, leaving these two, the proud white man of a past age and the poor Hottentot, to keep their eternal vigil in the midst of the eternal snows, we crept out of the cave into the welcome sunshine and resumed our path, wondering in our hearts how many hours it would be before we were even as they are. When we had walked about half a mile, we came to the edge of the plateau, for the nipple of the mountain does not rise out of its exact center, though from the desert side it had seemed to do so. What lay below us we could not see, for the landscape was wreathed in billows of morning fog. Presently, however, the higher layers of mist cleared a little and revealed, at the end of a large slope of snow, a patch of green grass, some five hundred yards beneath us, through which a stream was running. Nor was this all. By the stream, basking in the bright sun, stood and lay a group of from ten to fifteen large antelopes. At that distance we could not see of what species. 
the sight filled us with unreasoning joy. If only we could get it, there was food in plenty. But the question was how to do so. The beasts were fully six hundred yards off, a very long shot, and one not to be depended on when our lives hung on the results. Rapidly we discussed the advisability of trying to stalk the game, but in the end dismissed it reluctantly. To begin with, the wind was not favorable, and further we must certainly be perceived, however careful we were, against the blinding background of snow which we should be obliged to traverse. "'Well, we must have a try from where we are,' said Sir Henry. "'Which shall it be, Quartermain, the repeating rifles or the expresses?' "'Here again was a question. "'The Winchester repeaters, of which we had two, "'Umbopa carrying poor Ventvogels as well as his own, "'were sighted up to a thousand yards, "'whereas the expresses were only sighted to three hundred and fifty beyond which shooting with them was more or less guesswork. On the other hand, if they did hit, the express bullets, being expanding, were much more likely to bring the game down. It was a knotty point, but I made up my mind that we must risk it and use the expresses. Let each of us take the buck opposite to him. Aim well at the point of the shoulder and high up, said I, and Umbopa, do you give the word, so that we may all fire together. Then came a pause, each of us aiming his level best, as indeed a man is likely to do when he knows that life itself depends upon the shot. Fire, said Umbopa in Zulu, and at almost the same instant the three rifles rang out loudly. Three clouds of smoke hung for a moment before us, and a hundred echoes went flying over the silent snow. Presently the smoke cleared and revealed, oh joy, a great buck lying on its back and kicking furiously in its death agony. We gave a yell of triumph. We were saved. We should not starve. Weak as we were, we rushed down the intervening slope of snow, and in ten minutes from the time of shooting, that animal's heart and liver were lying before us. But now a new difficulty arose. We had no fuel, and therefore could make no fire to cook them. We gazed at each other in dismay. Starving men should not be fanciful, said Good. We must eat raw meat. There was no other way out of the dilemma, and our gnawing hunger made the proposition less distasteful than it would otherwise have been. So we took the heart and liver and buried them for a few minutes in a patch of snow to cool them. Then we washed them in the ice-cold water of the stream, and lastly ate them greedily. It sounds horrible enough, but honestly I never tasted anything so good as that raw meat. In a quarter of an hour we were changed men. Our life and vigor came back to us. Our feeble pulses grew strong again, and the blood went coursing through our veins. But mindful of the results of overfeeding on starved stomachs, we were careful not to eat too much, stopping whilst we were still hungry. Thank heavens, said Sir Henry, that brute has saved our lives. What is it, Quartermain? I rose and went to look at the antelope, for I was not certain. It was about the size of a donkey with large curved horns. I had never seen one like it before. The species was new to me. It was brown in color, with faint red stripes, and grew a thick coat. I afterwards discovered that the natives of that wonderful country call these bucks Inko. They are very rare, and only found at a great altitude where no other game will live. This animal was fairly hit high up in the shoulder, though whose bullet brought it down we could not, of course, discover. I believe that Good, mindful of his marvelous shot at the giraffe, secretly set it down to his own prowess, and we did not contradict him. We had been so busy satisfying our hunger that hitherto we had not found time to look about us. But now, having set Umbopa to cut off as much of the best meat as we were likely to be able to carry, we began to inspect our surroundings. The mist had cleared away 
for it was eight o'clock, and the sun had sucked it up, so we were able to take in all the country before us at a glance. I know not how to describe the glorious panorama which unfolded itself to our gaze. I have never seen anything like it before, nor shall, I suppose, again. Behind and over us towered Sheba's snowy breasts, and below, some five thousand feet beneath where we stood, lay league on league of the most lovely champagne country. Here were dense patches of lofty forest. There a great river wound its silvery way. To the left stretched a vast expanse of rich undulating veld or grassland, whereon we could just make out countless herds of game or cattle. At that distance we could not tell which. This expanse appeared to be ringed in by a wall of distant mountains. To the right the country was more or less mountainous, that is, solitary hills stood up from its level, with stretches of cultivated land between, amongst which we could see groups of dome-shaped huts. The landscape lay before us as a map, wherein rivers flashed like silver snakes and alp-like peaks crowned with wildly twisted snow wreaths rose in grandeur, whilst over all was the glad sunlight and the breath of nature's happy life. Two curious things struck us as we gaze. First, that the country before us must lie at least 3,000 feet higher than the desert we had crossed, and secondly, that all the rivers flowed from south to north. As we had painful reason to know, there was no water upon the southern side of the vast range on which we stood, but on the northern face were many streams, most of which appeared to unite with the great river we could see winding away farther than our eyes could follow. We sat down for a while and gazed in silence at this wonderful view. Presently Sir Henry spoke. "'Isn't there something on the map about Solomon's great road?' he said. I nodded, for I was still gazing out over the far country. Well, look, there it is, and he pointed a little to our right. Good and I looked accordingly, and there, winding away towards the plain, was what appeared to be a wide turnpike road. We had not seen it at first, because, on reaching the plain, it turned behind some broken country. We did not say anything, at least not much. We were beginning to lose the sense of wonder. Somehow it did not seem particularly unnatural that we should find a sort of Roman road in this strange land. We accepted the fact, that was all. Well, said Good, must be quite near us if we cut off the, to the right. Hadn't we better be making a start? This was sound advice and so soon as we had washed our faces and hands in the stream, we acted on it. For a mile or more we made our way over boulders and across patches of snow, till suddenly, on reaching the top of the little rise, we found the road at our feet. It was a splendid road, cut out of the solid rock, at least fifty feet wide, and apparently well kept, though the odd thing was that it seemed to begin there, we walked down and stood on it, but one single hundred paces behind us, in the direction of Sheba's breasts, it vanished, the entire surface of the mountain being strewn with boulders interspaced with patches of snow. "'What do you make of this, Quartermain?' asked Sir Henry. I shook my head. I could make nothing of the thing. "'I have it,' said Good. The road, no doubt, ran right over the range and across the desert on the other side. But the sand there has covered it up, and above us it has been obliterated by some volcanic eruption of molten lava. This seemed a good suggestion. At any rate, we accepted it, and proceeded down the mountain. It proved a very different business, traveling along downhill on that magnificent pathway with full stomachs, from what it was traveling uphill over the snow quite starved and almost frozen. 
Indeed, had it not been for melancholy recollections of poor Ventvogel's sad fate, and of that grim cave where he kept company with the old Dom, we should have felt positively cheerful, notwithstanding the sense of unknown dangers before us. Every mile we walked, the atmosphere grew softer and balmier, and the country before us shone with a yet more luminous beauty. As for the road itself, I never saw such an engineering work, though Sir Henry said that the great road over the St. Gothard in Switzerland is very similar. No difficulty had been too great for the old-world engineer who laid it out. At one place we came to a ravine three hundred feet broad and at least a hundred feet deep. This vast gulf was actually filled in with huge blocks of dressed stone, having arches pierced through them at the bottom for a waterway, over which the road went on sublimely. At another place it was cut in zigzags out of the side of a precipice five hundred feet deep, and in a third it tunneled through the base of an intervening ridge, a space of thirty yards or more. Here we noticed that the sides of the tunnel were covered with quaint sculptures, mostly of mailed figures driving in chariots. One, which was exceedingly beautiful, represented a whole battle scene with a convoy of captives being marched off in the distance. Well, said Sir Henry, after inspecting this ancient work of art, it is very well to call this Solomon's Road, but my humble opinion is that the Egyptians had been here before Solomon's people ever set a foot on it. If this isn't Egyptian or Phoenician handiwork, I must say that it is very like it. By midday we had advanced sufficiently down the mountain to search the region where wood was to be met with. First we came to scattered bushes, which grew more and more frequent, till at last we found the road winding through a vast grove of silver trees similar to those which are to be seen on the slopes of Table Mountain at Cape Town. I had never before met with them in all my wanderings, except at the Cape, and their appearance here astonished me greatly. Ah, said Good, surveying these shining-leaved trees with evident enthusiasm, here is lots of wood. Let us stop and cook some dinner. I have about digested that raw heart. Nobody objected to this. So leaving the road, we made our way to a stream which was babbling away not far off, and soon had a goodly fire of dry boughs blazing. Cutting off some substantial hunks from the flesh of the inco which we had brought with us, we proceeded to toast them on the end of sharp sticks, as one sees the Kaffirs do, and ate them with relish. After filling ourselves, we lit our pipes and gave ourselves up to enjoyment that, compared with the hardships we had recently undergone, seemed almost heavenly. The brook, of which the banks were clothed with dense masses of a gigantic species of maidenhair fern, interspersed with feathery tufts of wild asparagus, sung merrily at our side. The soft air murmured through the leaves of the silver trees, doves cooed around, and bright-winged birds flashed like living gems from bough to bough. It was a paradise. The magic of the place, combined with an overwhelming sense of dangers left behind, and of the promised land reached at last, seemed to charm us into silence. Sir Henry and Umbopa sat conversing in a mixture of broken English and kitchen Zulu in a low voice, but earnestly enough, and I lay with my eyes half shut upon that fragrant bed of fern and watched them. Presently I missed good, and I looked to see what had become of him. Soon I observed him sitting by the bank of the stream in which he had been bathing. He had nothing on but his flannel shirt, and his natural habits of extreme neatness having reasserted themselves, he was actively employed in making a most elaborate toilet. He had washed his gutta-percha collar, had thoroughly shaken out his trousers, coat, and waistcoat, 
and was now folding them up neatly till he was ready to put them on, shaking his head sadly as he scanned the numerous rents and tears in them, which naturally had resulted from our frightful journey. Then he took his boots, scrubbed them with a handful of fern, and finally rubbed them over with a piece of fat, which he had carefully saved from the inco meat, till they looked, comparatively speaking, respectable. Having inspected them judiciously through his eyeglass, he put the boots on and began a fresh operation. From a little bag that he carried, he produced a pocket comb in which was fixed a tiny looking glass, and in this he surveyed himself. Apparently he was not satisfied, for he proceeded to do his hair with great care. Then came a pause while he again contemplated the effect. Still it was not satisfactory. He felt his chin, on which the accumulated scrub of a ten days beard was flourishing. Surely, thought I, he is not going to try to shave, but so it was. Taking the piece of fat with which he had greased his boots, Good washed it thoroughly in the stream. Then, diving again into the bag, he brought out a little pocket razor with a guard to it, such as are bought by people who are afraid of cutting themselves, or by those about to undertake a sea voyage. Then he rubbed his face and chin vigorously with the fat and began. Evidently it proved a painful process, for he groaned very much over it, and I was convulsed with inward laughter as I watched him struggling with that stubbly beard. It seemed so very odd that a man should take the trouble to shave himself with a piece of fat in such a place and in our circumstances. At last he succeeded in getting the hair off the right side of his face and chin, when suddenly I, who was watching, became conscious of a flash of light that passed just by his head. Good sprang up with a profane exclamation. If it had not been a safety razor, he would certainly have cut his throat. And so did I, without the exclamation. And this was what I saw. Standing not more than twenty paces from where I was, and ten from Good, were a group of men. They were very tall and copper-colored, and some of them wore great plumes of black feathers and short cloaks of leopard skins. This was all I noticed at the moment. In front of them stood a youth of about seventeen, his hand still raised and his body bent forward in the attitude of a Grecian statue of a spear-thrower. Evidently the flash of light had been caused by a weapon which he had hurled. As I looked, an old soldier-like man stepped forward out of the group, and catching the youth by the arm said something to him. Then they advanced upon us. Sir Henry, Good, and Umbopa by this time had seized their rifles and lifted them threateningly. The party of natives still came on. It struck me that they could not know what rifles were, or they would not have treated them with such contempt. "'Put down your guns!' I hallowed to the others." seeing that our only chance of safety lay in conciliation. They obeyed, and walking to the front I addressed the elderly man who had checked the youth. Greetings, I said in Zulu, not knowing what language to use. To my surprise I was understood. Greeting, answered the old man, not indeed in the same tongue, but in a dialect so closely allied to it, that neither Umbopa nor myself had any difficulty in understanding him. Indeed, as we afterwards found out, the language spoken by this people is an old-fashioned form of the Zulu tongue, bearing about the same relationship to it that the English of Chaucer does to the English of the 19th century. Whence come you, he went on, who are you, and why are the faces of three of you white? and the face of the fourth as the face of our mother's sons. And he pointed to Umbopa. I looked at Umbopa as he said it, and it flashed across me that he was right. The face of Umbopa was like the faces of the men before me, and so was his great form like their forms. But I had not time to reflect on this coincidence. We are strangers and come in peace, I answered, speaking very slowly, so that he might understand me. "'and this man is our servant.' "'You lie,' he answered. "'No strangers can cross the mountains where all things perish. 
But what do your lives matter? If ye are strangers, then ye must die, for no strangers may live in the land of the Kukuanas. It is the king's law. Prepare then to die, O strangers. I was slightly staggered at this, more especially as I saw the hands of some of the men steal down to their sides, where hung on each what looked to me like a large and heavy knife. "'What does the beggar say?' asked Good. "'He says we are going to be killed,' I answered grimly. "'Oh, Lord!' groaned Good. And as was his way, when perplexed, he put his hand to his false teeth, dragging the top set down and allowing them to fly back to his jaw with a snap. It was a most fortunate move, for next second the dignified crowd of Kukuanas uttered a simultaneous yell of horror and bolted back some yards. "'What's up?' said I. "'It's his teeth,' whispered Sir Henry excitedly. "'He moved them. "'Take them out, good. Take them out.' He obeyed, slipping the set into the sleeve of his flannel shirt. In another second, curiosity had overcome fear, and the men advanced slowly. Apparently they had now forgotten their amiable intention of killing us. "'How is it, O strangers?' asked the old man solemnly. "'That this fat man, pointing to Good, who was clad in nothing but boots and a flannel shirt, "'and had only half finished his shaving, "'whose body is clothed and whose legs are bare, who grows hair on one side of his sickly face and not on the other, and who wears one shining and transparent eye. How is it, I ask, that he has teeth which move of themselves, coming away from the jaws and returning of their own will? Open your mouth, I said to Good, who promptly curled up his lips and grinned at the old gentleman like an angry dog, revealing to his astonished gaze two thin red lines of gum as utterly innocent of ivories as a newborn elephant. The audience gasped. "'Where are his teeth?' they shouted. "'With our eyes we saw them.' Turning his head slowly and with a gesture of ineffable contempt, Good swept his hand across his mouth. Then he grinned again, and lo, there were two rows of lovely teeth. Now the young man who had flung the knife threw himself down on the grass and gave vent to a prolonged howl of terror, and as for the old gentleman, his knees knocked together with fear. "'I see that ye are spirits,' he said falteringly. "'Did ever man born of woman have hair on one side of his face and not on the other, or a round and transparent eye, or teeth which moved and melted away and grew again?' Pardon us, O oh my lords. Here was luck indeed, and needless to say, I jumped at the chance. It is granted, I said with an imperial smile. Nay, ye shall know the truth. We come from another world, though we are men such as ye. We come, I went on, from the biggest star that shines at night. Oh, oh, groaned the chorus of astonished aborigines. Yes, I went on, we do indeed, and again I smiled benignly as I uttered that amazing lie. We come to stay with you a little while, and to bless you by our sojourn. Ye will see, O oh friends, that I have prepared myself for this visit by the learning of your language. It is so, it is so, said the chorus. Only, my lord, put in the old gentleman, Thou hast learned it very badly. I cast an indignant glance at him, and he quailed. Now, friends, I continued, ye might think that after so long a journey we should find it in our hearts to avenge such a reception. May have to strike cold in death the imperious hand that, that in short, threw a knife at the head of him whose teeth come and go. Spare him, my lords, said the old man in supplication. He is the king's son, and I am his uncle. If anything befalls him, his blood will be required at my hands. Yes, that is certainly so, put in the young man with great emphasis. Ye may perhaps doubt our power to avenge, I went on, 
heedless of this by-play. Stay, I will show you. Here, thou dog and slave, addressing Umbopa in a savage tone, give me the magic tube that speaks, and I tipped a wink towards my express rifle. Umbopa rose to the occasion, and with something as nearly resembling a grin as I have ever seen on his dignified face, he handed me the gun. It is here, O Lord of Lords, he said, with a deep obeisance. Now just before I had asked for the rifle, I had perceived a little Clipspringer antelope standing on a mass of rock about seventy yards away, and determined to risk the shot. You see that buck? I said, pointing the animal out to the party before me. Tell me, is it possible for man born of woman to kill it from here with a noise? It is not possible, my lord, answered the old man. Yet shall I kill it, I said quietly. The old man smiled. That my lord cannot do, he answered. I raised the rifle and covered the buck. It was a small animal, and one which a man might well be excused for missing, but I knew that it would not do to miss. I drew a deep breath and slowly pressed on the trigger. The buck stood still as a stone. Bang! Thud! The antelope sprang into the air and fell on the rock dead as a doornail. A groan of simultaneous terror burst from the group before us. "'If you want meat,' I remarked coolly, "'go fetch that buck.' The old man made a sign, and one of his followers departed, and presently returned, bearing the clipspringer. I noticed with satisfaction that I had hit it fairly behind the shoulder. They gathered round the poor creature's body, gazing at the bullet hole in consternation." "'Ye see,' I said, "'I do not speak empty words.' "'There was no answer. "'If ye yet doubt our power,' I went on, "'let one of you go and stand upon that rock "'that I may make him as this buck.' "'None of them seemed at all inclined to take the hint, "'till at last the king's son spoke. "'It is well said. "'Do thou, my uncle, go stand upon the rock.' It is but a buck that the magic has killed. Surely it cannot kill a man. The old gentleman did not take the suggestion in good part. Indeed, he seemed hurt. No, no, he ejaculated hastily. My old eyes have seen enough. These are wizards indeed. Let us bring them to the king. Yet if any should wish a further proof, let him stand upon the rock, that the magic tube may speak with him. There was a most general and hasty expression of dissent. Let not good magic be wasted on our poor bodies, said one. We are satisfied. All the witchcraft of our people cannot show the like of this. It is so, remarked the old gentleman in a tone of intense relief. Without any doubt, it is so. Listen, children of the stars, children of the shining eye and the movable teeth, who roar out in thunder and slay from afar. I am Infadus, son of Kafa, once king of the Kukuana people. This youth is Scraga. He nearly scragged me, murmured Good. Scraga, son of Twala, the great king. Twala, husband of a thousand wives, chief and lord paramount of the Kukuanas, keeper of the great road, terror of his enemies, student of the black arts, leader of a hundred thousand warriors, Twala the one-eyed, the black, the terrible. So, said I superciliously, lead us then to Twala. We do not talk with low people and underlings. It is well, my lords, we will lead you, but the way is long. We are hunting three days' journey from the place of the king. But let my lords have patience, and we will lead them. So be it, I said carelessly. All time is before us, for we do not die. We are ready. Lead on. But in Fadus and thou, Scraga, beware. 
play no monkey tricks. Set for us no foxes' snares, for before your brains of mud have thought of them, we shall know and avenge. The light of the transparent eye of him with the bare legs and the half-haired face shall destroy you and go through your land. His vanishing teeth shall affix themselves fast in you and eat you up, you and your wives and children. The magic tubes shall argue with you loudly and make you as sieves. Beware. This magnificent address did not fail of its effects, Indeed, it might almost have been spared, so deeply were our friends already impressed with our powers. The old man made a deep obeisance and murmured the words, Kum, Kum, which I afterwards discovered was their royal salute, corresponding to the Baete of the Zulus, and turning addressed his followers. These at once proceeded to lay hold of all our goods and chattels in order to bear them for us, "'excepting only the guns, which they would on no account touch. "'They even seized Good's clothes that, as the reader may remember, "'were neatly folded up beside him. "'He saw and made a dive for them, and a loud altercation ensued. "'Let not my lord of the transparent eye and the melting teeth touch them,' said the old man. "'Surely his slave shall carry the things. "'But I want to put them on.' "'roared good in nervous English. "'Umbopa translated. "'Nay, my lord,' answered Infadus. "'Would my lord cover up his beautiful white legs? "'Although he is so dark, good has a singularly white skin. "'From the eye of his servants, "'have we offended my lord that he should do such a thing?' "'Here I nearly exploded with laughing, "'and meanwhile one of the men started on with the garments.' "'Damn it!' roared Good. "'That black villain has got my trousers!' "'Look here, Good,' said Sir Henry. "'You have appeared in this country in a certain character, "'and you must live up to it. "'It will never do for you to put on trousers again. "'Henceforth you must exist in a flannel shirt, "'a pair of boots, and an eyeglass.' "'Yes,' I said, "'and with whiskers on one side of your face and not on the other. "'If you change any of these things, "'the people will think that we are impostors. "'I am very sorry for you, but seriously, you must. "'If once they begin to suspect us, "'our lives will not be worth a brass farthing.' "'Do you really think so?' said Good gloomily. "'I do indeed.' Your beautiful white legs and your eyeglass are now the features of our party, and as Sir Henry says, you must live up to them. Be thankful that you've got your boots on and that the air is warm. Good sighed and said no more, but it took him a fortnight to become accustomed to his new and scant attire. End of chapter 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 8 We Enter Kukuana Land All that afternoon we traveled along the magnificent roadway, which trended steadily in the northwesterly direction. Infadus and Skraga walked with us, but their followers marched about one hundred paces ahead. Infadus, I said at length, who made this road? It was made, my lord, of old time, none know how or when, not even the wise woman Gagul, who has lived for generations. We are not old enough to remember its making. None can fashion such roads now, but the king suffers no grass to grow upon it. And whose are the writings on the wall of the caves through which we have passed on the road, I asked, referring to the Egyptian-like sculptures that we had seen. My lord, the hands that made the road wrote the wonderful writings. We know not who wrote them. When did the Kukuana people come into this country? 
my lord, the race came down here like the breath of a storm ten thousand thousand moons ago, from the great lands which lie there beyond, and he pointed to the north. They could travel no further because of the high mountains which ring in the land. So say the old voices of our fathers that have descended to us the children, and so says Gagool the wise woman, the smeller out of witches. And again he pointed to the snow-clad peaks. The country, too, was good, so they settled here, and grew strong and powerful, and now our numbers are like the sea sand. And when Twala, the king, calls up his regiments, their plumes cover the plain so far as the eye of man can reach. And if the land is walled in with mountains, who is there for the regiments to fight with? Nay, my lord, the country is open there towards the north, and now and again warriors sweep down upon us in clouds from a land we know not, and we slay them. It is the third part of the life of a man since there was a war. Many thousands died in it, but we destroyed those who came to eat us up. So since then there has been no war. Your warriors must grow weary of resting on their spears in Vadus. My lord, there was one war just after we destroyed the people that came down upon us. But it was a civil war. Dog ate dog. How was that? My lord the king, my half-brother, had a brother born at the same birth and of the same woman. It is not our custom, my lord, to suffer twins to live. The weaker always must die. But the mother of the king hid away the feeble child, which was born the last, for her heart yearned over it, and that child is Twala, the king. I am his younger brother, born of another wife. Well, my lord, Kafa, our father, died when we came to manhood, and my brother Imotu was made king in his place, and for a space reigned and had a son by his favorite wife. When the babe was three years old, just after the great war, during which no man could sow or reap, a famine came upon the land, and the people murmured because of the famine, and looked round like a starved lion for something to rend. Then it was that Gagool, the wise and terrible woman, who does not die, made a proclamation to the people, saying, The king Imotu is no king. And at the time Imotu was sick with a wound and lay in his kraal, not able to move. Then Gagool went into a hut and led out Twala, my half-brother and twin brother to the king, whom she had hidden among the caves and rocks since he was born. And stripping the muka waistcloth off his loins, showed the people of the Kukuanas the mark of the sacred snake coiled round his middle, wherewith the eldest son of the king is marked at birth, and cried out loud, Behold your king whom I have saved for you even to this day. Now the people being mad with hunger, and altogether bereft of reason and the knowledge of truth, cried out, The king! The king! But I knew that it was not so, for Emotu, my brother, was the elder of the twins and our lawful king. Then, just as the tumult was at its height, Emotu, the king, though he was very sick, crawled from his hut, holding his wife by the hand, and followed by his little son Ignosi, that is, by interpretation, the lightning. What is this noise? he asked. Why cry ye, the king, the king? Then Twala, his twin brother, born of the same woman and in the same hour, ran to him, and taking him by the hair, stabbed him through the heart with his knife. And the people, being fickle and ever ready to worship the rising sun, clapped their hands and cried, Twala is king. Now we know that Twala is king. And what became of Imotu's wife and her son Ignosi? Did Twala kill them too? Nay, my lord. When she saw that her lord was dead, the queen seized the child with a cry and ran away. Two days afterward she came to a kraal very hungry, 
and none would give her milk or food now that her lord the king was dead, for all men hate the unfortunate. But at nightfall a little child, a girl, crept out and brought her corn to eat, and she blessed the child, and went on towards the mountains with her boy before the sun rose again. And there she must have perished, for none have seen her since, nor the child Ignosi. Then if this child Ignosi had lived, he would be the true king of the Kukuana people? That is so, my lord, the sacred snake is round his middle. If he lives, he is king. But alas, he is long dead. See, my lord, and Infadus pointed to a vast collection of huts surrounded by a fence, which was in its turn encircled by a great ditch that lay on the plain beneath us. That is the kraal where the wife of Imotu was last seen with the child Ignosi. It is there that we shall sleep tonight, if indeed, he added doubtfully, my lord, sleep it all upon this earth. When we are among the Kukuanas, my good friend Infadus, we do as the Kukuanas do, I said majestically, and turned round quickly to address Good, who was tramping along sullenly behind, his mind fully occupied with unsatisfactory attempts to prevent his flannel shirt from flapping in the evening breeze. To my astonishment, I butted into Umbopa, who was walking along immediately behind me, and very evidently had been listening with the greatest interest to my conversation with Infadus. The expression on his face was most curious, and gave me the idea of a man who was struggling with partial success to bring something long forgotten back into his mind. All this while we had been pressing on at a good rate towards the undulating plain beneath us, the mountains we had crossed now loomed high above our heads, and Sheba's breasts were veiled modestly in diaphanous wreaths of mist. As we went, the country grew more and more lovely. The vegetation was luxuriant, without being tropical. The sun was bright and warm, but not burning. And a gracious breeze blew softly along the odorous slopes of the mountain. Indeed, this new land was little less than an earthly paradise. In beauty, in natural wealth, and in climate, I have never seen its like. The Transvaal is a fine country, but it is nothing to Kukuanaland. So soon as we started, Infadus had dispatched a runner to warn the people of the corral, which, by the way, was in his military command, of our arrival. This man had departed at an extraordinary speed, which Infadus informed me he would keep up all the way, as running was an exercise much practiced among his people. The result of this message now became apparent. When we arrived within two miles of the corral, we could see that company after company of men were issuing from its gates and marching towards us. Sir Henry laid his hand upon my arm and remarked that it looked as though we were going to meet with a warm reception. Something in his tone attracted Infadus's attention. "'Let not my lords be afraid,' he said hastily, "'for in my breast there dwells no guile. "'This regiment is one under my command "'and comes out by my orders to greet you.' "'I nodded easily, though I was not quite easy in my mind. "'About half a mile from the gates of this corral "'is a long stretch of rising ground "'sloping gently upward from the road, "'and here the companies formed. "'It was a splendid sight to see them, "'each company about three hundred strong, charging swiftly up the rise with flashing spears and waving plumes to take their appointed places. By the time we reached the slope, twelve such companies, or in all three thousand six hundred men, had passed out and taken up their positions along the road. Presently we came to the first company and were able to gaze in astonishment on the most magnificent set of warriors that I have ever seen. They were all men of mature age, mostly veterans of about forty, and not one of them was under six feet in height, whilst many stood six feet three or four. They wore upon their heads heavy black plumes of sacabula feathers, like those which adorned our guides. 
About their waists and beneath the right knees were bound circlets of white ox tails, while in their left hands they carried round shields measuring about twenty inches across. These shields are very curious. The framework is made of an iron plate beaten out thin, over which is stretched milk-white ox hide. The weapons that each man bore were simple but most effective, consisting of a short and very heavy two-edged spear with a wooden shaft, the blade being about six inches across at the widest part. These spears are not used for throwing, but like the Zulu Banguan or stabbing Asagai, are for close quarters only, when the wound inflicted by them is terrible. In addition to his Banguan, every man carried three large and heavy knives, each knife weighing about two pounds. One knife was fixed in the oxtail girdle, and the other two at the back of the round shield. These knives, which are called tolas by the Kukuanas, take the place of the throwing assegai of the Zulus. The Kukuana warriors can cast them with great accuracy to a distance of 50 yards, and it is their custom on charging to hurl a volley of them at the enemy as they come to close quarters. Each company remained still as a collection of bronze statues till we were opposite to it, when, at a signal given by its commanding officer, who, distinguished by a leopard-skin cloak, stood some paces in front, every spear was raised into the air, and from three hundred throats sprang forth with a sudden roar the royal salute of Kum. Then, so soon as we had passed, the company formed up behind us and followed us towards the corral, till at last the whole regiment of the greys, so called from their white shields, the crack troops of the Kukuana people, was marching in our rear with a tread that shook the ground. At length, branching off from Solomon's great road, we came to the wide fosse surrounding the corral, which is at least a mile round, and fenced with a strong palisade of piles formed of the trunks of trees. At the gateway this fosse is spanned by a primitive drawbridge, which was let down by the guard to allow us to pass in. The corral is exceedingly well laid out. Through the center runs a wide pathway intersected at right angles by other pathways, so arranged as to cut the huts into square blocks, each block being the quarters of a company. The huts are dome-shaped and built, like those of the Zulus, of a framework of wattle, beautifully thatched with grass, but unlike the Zulu huts, they have doorways through which men could walk. Also they are much larger, and surrounded by a veranda about six feet wide, beautifully paved with powdered lime trodden hard. All along each side of this wide pathway that pierces the corral were ranged hundreds of women brought out by curiosity to look at us. These women, for a native race, are exceedingly handsome. They are tall and graceful, and their figures are wonderfully fine. The hair, though short, is rather curly than woolly. The features are frequently aquiline, and the lips are not unpleasantly thick, as is the case among most African races. But what struck us most was their exceedingly quiet and dignified air. They were as well-bred in their way as the habitués of a fashionable drawing-room, and in this respect they differ from Zulu women and their cousins the Maasai, who inhabit the district beyond Zanzibar. Their curiosity had brought them out to see us, but they allowed no rude expressions of astonishment or savage criticism to pass their lips as we trudged wearily in front of them. Not even when old Infadus with a surreptitious motion of the hand, pointed out the crowning wonder of poor Good's beautiful white legs, did they suffer the feeling of intense admiration which evidently mastered their minds to find expression. They fixed their dark eyes upon this new and snowy loveliness, for, as I think I have said, Good's skin is exceedingly white, and that was all, but it was quite enough for Good, who is modest by nature. When we reached the center of the corral, Infadus halted at the door of a large hut, 
which was surrounded at a distance by a circle of smaller ones. "'Enter, sons of the stars,' he said in a magniloquent voice, "'and deign to rest a while in our humble habitations. "'A little food shall be brought to you, "'so that ye may have no need to draw your belts tight from hunger. "'Some honey and some milk and an ox or two and a few sheep. "'Not much, my lords, but still a little food.' It is good, said I. In Fadus we are weary with traveling through realms of air. Now let us rest. Accordingly we entered the hut, which we found amply prepared for our comfort. Couches of tanned skins were spread for us to lie on, and water was placed for us to wash in. Presently we heard a shouting outside, and stepping to the door saw a line of damsels bearing milk and roasted mealies and honey in a pot. Behind these were some youths driving a fat young ox. We received the gifts, and then one of the young men drew the knife from his girdle and dexterously cut the ox's throat. In ten minutes it was dead, skinned, and jointed. The best of the meat was then cut off for us, and the rest, in the name of our party, I presented to the warriors round us, who took it and distributed the white lord's gift. Umbopa set to work, with the assistance of an extremely prepossessing young woman, to boil our portion in a large earthenware pot over a fire which was built outside the hut. And when it was nearly ready, we sent a message to Infadus and asked him and Scraga, the king's son, to join us. Presently they came, and sitting down upon little stools, of which there were several about the hut, for the Kukuanas do not, in general, squat upon their haunches like the Zulus, they helped us to get through our dinner. The old gentleman was most affable and polite, but it struck me that the young one regarded us with doubt. Together with the rest of the party, he had been overawed by our white appearance and our magic properties, but it seemed to me that, on discovering that we ate, drank, and slept like other mortals, his awe was beginning to wear off, and to be replaced by a sullen suspicion, which made me feel rather uncomfortable. In the course of our meal, Sir Henry suggested to me that it might be well to try to discover if our hosts knew anything of his brother's fate, or if they had ever seen or heard of him. But on the whole, I thought it would be wiser to say nothing of the matter at this time. It was difficult to explain a relative lost from the stars. After supper, we produced our pipes and lit them, a proceeding which filled Infadus and Scraga with astonishment. The Kukuanas were evidently unacquainted with the divine delights of tobacco smoke. The herb is grown among them extensively, but like the Zulus, they use it for snuff only, and quite fail to identify it in its new form. Presently I asked Infadus when we were to proceed on our journey, and was delighted to learn that preparations had been made for us to leave on the following morning, messengers having already departed to inform Twala the king of our coming. It appeared that Twala was at his principal place, known as Lu making ready for the great annual feast which was to be held in the first week of June. At this gathering all the regiments, with the exception of certain detachments left behind for garrison purposes, are brought up and paraded before the king, and the great annual witch hunt, of which more by and by, is held. We were to start at dawn, and Infadus, who was to accompany us, expected that we should reach Lu on the night of the second day, unless we were detained by accident or by swollen rivers. When they had given us this information, our visitors bade us good night, and having arranged to watch turn turn about, three of us flung ourselves down and slept the sweet sleep of the weary, whilst the fourth sat up on the lookout for possible treachery. End of chapter 8 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 9 
Twala the King. It will not be necessary for me to detail at length the incidents of our journey to Lou. It took two full days traveling along Solomon's Great Road, which pursued its even course right into the heart of Kukuana land. Suffice it to say that as we went, the country seemed to grow richer and richer, and the corrals, with their wide surrounding belts of cultivation, more and more numerous. They were all built upon the same principles as the first camp which we had reached, and were guarded by ample garrisons of troops. Indeed, in Kukuana land, as among the Germans, the Zulus, and the Maasai, every able-bodied man is a soldier, so that the whole force of the nation is available for its wars, offensive or defensive. As we traveled, we were overtaken by thousands of warriors hurrying up to Lou to be present at the great annual review and festival, and more splendid troops I never saw. At sunset, on the second day, we stopped to rest a while upon the summit of some heights over which the road ran, and there on a beautiful and fertile plain before us lay Lou itself. For a native town, it is an enormous place, quite five miles round, I should say, with outlying corrals projecting from it that serve on grand occasions as cantonments for the regiments, and a curious horseshoe-shaped hill, with which we were destined to become better acquainted, about two miles to the north. It is beautifully situated, and through the center of the corral, dividing it into two portions, runs a river, which appeared to be bridged in several places, the same indeed that we had seen from the slopes of Sheba's breasts. Sixty or seventy miles away, three great snow-capped mountains, placed at the points of a triangle, started out of the level plain. The conformation of these mountains is unlike that of Sheba's breasts, being sheer and precipitous instead of smooth and rounded. Infadus saw us looking at them and volunteered a remark. The road ends there, he said, pointing to the mountains, known among the Kukuanas as the Three Witches. Why does it end? I asked. Who knows? He answered with a shrug. The mountains are full of caves, and there is a great pit between them. It is there that the wise men of old time used to go to get whatever it was they came for to this country, and it is there now that our kings are buried in the place of death. What was it they came for? I asked eagerly. Nay, I know not. My lords who have dropped from the stars should know, he answered with a quick look. Evidently he knew more than he chose to say. Yes, I went on, you are right. In the stars we learn many things. I have heard, for instance, that the wise men of old came to these mountains to find bright stones, pretty playthings, and yellow iron. My lord is wise, he answered coldly. I am but a child and cannot talk with my lord on such matters. My lord must speak with Gagool the old at the king's place, who is wise even as my lord. And he went away. So soon as he was gone, I turned to the others and pointed out the mountains. There are Solomon's diamond mines, I said. Umbopa was standing with them, apparently plunged in one of the fits of abstraction which were common to him, and caught my words. Yes, Makumazan, he put in, in Zulu, the diamonds are surely there, and you shall have them, since you white men are so fond of toys and money. How dost that know that, Umbopa? I asked sharply, for I did not like his mysterious ways. He laughed. I dreamed it in the night, white men. Then he too turned on his heel and went. Now what, said Sir Henry, is our black friend driving at? He knows more than he chooses to say, that is clear. By the way, Quartermain, has he heard anything of, of my brother? 
Nothing. He has asked everyone he has become friendly with, but they all declare that no white man has ever been seen in the country before. Do you suppose that he got here at all? suggested Good. We have only reached the place by a miracle. Is it likely he could have reached it without the map? I don't know, said Sir Henry gloomily, but somehow I think that I shall find him. Slowly the sun sank, then suddenly darkness rushed down on the land like a tangible thing. There was no breathing space between the day and night, no soft transformation scene, for in these latitudes twilight does not exist. The change from day to night is as quick and as absolute as the change from life to death. The sun sank and the world was wreathed in shadows. But not for long, for, see in the west there is a glow, then come rays of silver light, and at last the full and glorious moon lights up the plain and shoots its gleaming arrows far and wide, filling the earth with a faint refulgence. We stood and watched the lovely sight, whilst the stars grew pale before this chastened majesty, and felt our hearts lifted up in the presence of a beauty that I cannot describe. Mine has been a rough life, but there are a few things I am thankful to have lived for, and one of them is to have seen that moon shine over Kukuanaland. Presently our meditations were broken in upon by our polite friend Infadus. If my lords are rested, we will journey on to Lu, where a hut is made ready for my lords tonight. The moon is now bright, so that we shall not fall by the way. We assented, and in an hour's time were at the outskirts of the town, of which the extent, mapped out as it was by thousands of campfires, appeared absolutely endless. Indeed, Good, who is always fond of a bad joke, christened it Unlimited Lou. Soon we came to a moat with a drawbridge where we were met by the, the rattling of arms and the horse challenge of a sentry. Infadus gave some password that I could not catch, which was met with a salute, and we passed on through the central street of the great grass city. After nearly half an hour's tramp, past endless lines of huts, Infadus halted at last by the gate of a little group of huts which surrounded a small courtyard of powdered limestone and informed us that these were to be our poor quarters. We entered and found that a hut had been assigned to each of us. These huts were superior to any that we had yet seen and in each was a most comfortable bed made of tanned skins spread upon mattresses of aromatic grass. Food, too, was ready for us, and so soon as we had washed ourselves with water, which stood ready in earthenware jars, some young women of handsome appearance brought us roasted meats and mealy cobs daintily served on wooden platters, and presented them to us with deep obeisances. We ate and drank, and then, the beds having been all moved into one hut by our request, a precaution at which the amiable young ladies smiled, we flung ourselves down to sleep, thoroughly wearied with our long journey. When we woke, it was to find the sun high in the heavens, and the female attendants, who did not seem to be troubled by any false shame, already standing inside the hut, having been ordered to attend and help us to make ready. Make ready, indeed! growled good when one has only a flannel shirt and a pair of trousers that does not take long i wish you would ask them for my trousers quartermain i asked accordingly but was informed that these sacred relics had already been taken to the king who would see us in the forenoon somewhat to their astonishment and disappointment Having requested the young ladies to step outside, we proceeded to make the best toilet of which the circumstances admitted. Good even went the length of again shaving the right side of his face. The left, 
on which now appeared a very fair crop of whiskers, we impressed upon him he must on no account touch. As for ourselves, we were content with a good wash and combing our hair. Sir Henry's yellow locks were now almost upon his shoulders, and he looked more like an ancient Dane than ever, while my grizzled scrub was fully an inch long instead of half an inch, which is the general way I considered my maximum length. By the time that we had eaten our breakfast and smoked a pipe, a message was brought to us by no less a personage than Infadus himself, that Twala the king was ready to see us, if we would be pleased to come. We remarked in reply that we should prefer to wait till the sun was a little higher. We were yet weary with our journey, etc., etc. It is always well, when dealing with uncivilized people, not to be in too great a hurry. They are apt to mistake politeness for awe or servility. So, although we were quite as anxious to see Twala as Twala could be to see us, we sat down and waited for an hour, employing the interval in preparing such presents as our slender stock of goods permitted, namely, the Winchester rifle, which had been used by poor Ventvogel, and some beads. The rifle and ammunition we determined to present to His Royal Highness, and the beads were for his wives and courtiers. We had already given a few to Infadus and Skraga, and found that they were delighted with them, never having seen such things before. At length we declared that we were ready, and guided by Infadus, started off to the audience, Umbopa carrying the rifle and beads. After walking a few hundred yards, we came to an enclosure, something like that surrounding the huts which had been allotted to us, only fifty times as big, for it could not have covered less than six or seven acres of ground. All round the outside fence stood a row of huts which were the habitations of the king's wives. Exactly opposite the gateway, on the further side of the open space, was a very large hut, built by itself, in which His Majesty resided. All the rest was open ground, that is to say, it would have been open, had it not been filled by company after company of warriors, who were mustered there to the number of seven or eight thousand. These men stood still as statues as we advanced through them, and it would be impossible to give an adequate idea of the grandeur of the spectacle which they presented, with their waving plumes, their glancing spears, and iron-backed ox-hide shields. The space in front of the large hut was empty, but before it were placed several stools. On three of these, at a sign from Infadus, we seated ourselves, Umbopa standing behind us. As for Infadus, he took up a position by the door of the hut. So we waited for ten minutes or more in the midst of a dead silence, but conscious that we were the object of the concentrated gaze of some eight thousand pairs of eyes. It was a somewhat trying ordeal, but we carried it off as best we could. At length the door of the hut opened, and a gigantic figure, with a splendid tiger-skin carass flung over its shoulders, stepped out, followed by the boy Scraga, and what appeared to us to be a withered-up monkey wrapped in a fur cloak. The figure seated itself upon a stool. Scraga took his stand behind it, and the withered-up monkey crept on all fours into the shade of the hut and squatted down. Still there was silence. Then the gigantic figure slipped off the carass and stood up before us, a truly alarming spectacle. It was that of an enormous man, with the most entirely repulsive countenance we had ever beheld. This man's lips were as thick as a negro's. The nose was flat. He had but one gleaming black eye, for the other was represented by a hollow in the face, and his whole expression was cruel and sensual to a degree. From the large head rose a magnificent plume of white ostrich feathers, 
his body was clad in a shirt of shining chain armor, whilst round the waist and right knee were the usual garnishes of white oxtail. In his right hand was a huge spear, about the neck a thick torque of gold, and bound on the forehead shone dully a single and enormous uncut diamond. Still there was silence, but not for long. Presently the man, whom we rightly guessed to be the king, raised the great javelin in his hand. Instantly eight thousand spears were lifted in answer, and from eight thousand throats rang out the royal salute of Goom! Three times this was repeated, and each time the earth shook with the noise that can only be compared to the deepest notes of thunder. "'Be humble, O people,' piped out a thin voice, which seemed to come from the monkey in the shade. "'It is the king.' "'It is the king,' boomed out the eight thousand throats in answer. "'Be humble, O people, it is the king.' Then there was a silence again, dead silence. Presently, however, it was broken. A soldier on our left dropped his shield, which fell with a clatter onto the limestone flooring. Twala turned his one cold eye in the direction of the noise. "'Come hither, thou,' he said in a cold voice. A fine young man stepped out of the ranks and stood before him. "'It was thy shield that fell, thou awkward dog. Wilt thou make me a reproach in the eyes of these strangers from the stars?' What hast thou to say for thyself? We saw the poor fellow turn pale under his dusty skin. It was by chance, O calf of the black cow, he murmured. Then it is a chance for which thou must pay. Thou hast made me foolish. Prepare for death. I am the king's ox, was the low answer. Scraga, roared the king. Let me see how thou canst use thy spear. Kill me, this blundering fool. Scraga stepped forward with an ill-favored grin and lifted his spear. The poor victim covered his eyes with his hand and stood still. As for us, we were petrified with horror. Once, twice, he waved the spear and then struck. Ah, right home! The spear stood out a foot behind the soldier's back. He flung up his hands and dropped dead. From the multitude about us rose something like a murmur. It rolled round and round and died away. The tragedy was finished. There lay the corpse, and we had not yet realized that it had been enacted. Sir Henry sprang up and swore a great oath. Then, overpowered by the sense of silence, sat down again. "'The thrust was a good one,' said the king. "'Take him away.' Four men stepped out of the ranks, and lifting the body of the murdered man, carried it thence. "'Cover up the bloodstains! Cover them up!' piped out the thin voice that proceeded from the monkey-like figure. "'The king's word is spoken. The king's doom is done.' Thereupon a girl came forward from behind the hut, bearing a jar filled with powdered lime, which she scattered over the red mark, blotting it from sight. Sir Henry, meanwhile, was boiling with rage at what had happened. Indeed, it was with difficulty that we could keep him still. "'Sit down, for heaven's sake,' I whispered. "'Our lives depend on it.' He yielded and remained quiet. Twala sat silent until the traces of the tragedy had been removed. Then he addressed us. White people, he said, who come hither, whence I know not, and why I know not, greeting. Greeting, Dwala, king of the Kukuanas, I answered. White people, whence come ye, and what seek ye? We come from the stars, ask us not how, we come to see this land. Ye journey from far to see a little thing. And that man with you, pointing to Umbopa, 
Does he also come from the stars? Even so, there are people of thy color in the heavens above. But ask not of matters too high for thee, Twala the king. Ye speak with a loud voice, people of the stars, Twala answered in a tone which I scarcely liked. Remember that the stars are far off, and ye are here. How if I make you as him whom they bore away? I laughed out loud, though there was little laughter in my heart. O king, I said, be careful, walk warily over hot stones, lest thou shouldst burn thy feet. Hold the spear by the handle, lest thou should cut thy hands. Touch but one hair of our heads, and destruction shall come upon thee. What, have not these, pointing to Enfadus and Scraga, who, young villain that he was, was employed in cleaning the blood of the soldier off his spear, told thee what manner of men we are? Hast thou seen the like of us? And I pointed to Good, feeling quite sure that he had never seen anybody before who looked in the least like him as he then appeared. It is true I have not, said the king, surveying Good with interest. Have they not told thee how we strike with death from afar? I went on. They have told me, but I believe them not. Let me see you kill. Kill me a man among those who stand yonder. And he pointed to the opposite side of the corral. And I will believe. Nay, I answered, we shed no blood of men except in just punishment. But if thou wilt see, bid thy servants drive in an ox through the corral gates, and before he has run twenty paces I will strike him dead. Nay, laughed the king, kill me a man, and I will believe. Good, O king, so be it, I answered coolly. Do thou walk across the open space, and before thy feet reach the gate thou shalt be dead. Or if thou wilt not, send thy son, Scraga, whom at the moment it would have given me much pleasure to shoot. On hearing this suggestion, Scraga uttered a sort of howl and bolted into the hut. Twala frowned majestically. The suggestion did not please him. Let a young ox be driven in, he said. Two men at once departed, running swiftly. Now, Sir Henry, said I, do you shoot? I want to show this ruffian that I am not the only magician of the party. Sir Henry accordingly took his express and made ready. I hope I shall make a good shot, he groaned. You must, I answered. If you miss with the first barrel, let him have the second. Sight for a hundred and fifty yards and wait till the beast turns broadside on. Then came a pause, until presently we caught sight of an ox running straight for the corral gate. It came on through the gate, then catching sight of the vast concourse of people stopped stupidly, turned round and bellowed. Now's your time, I whispered. Up went the rifle. Bang! Thud, and the ox was kicking on his back, shot in the ribs. The semi-hollow bullet had done its work well, and a sigh of astonishment went up from the assembled thousands. I turned round coolly. Have I lied, O king? Nay, white man, it is the truth, was the somewhat awed answer. Listen, Twala, I went on, thou hast seen. Now know we come in peace, not in war. See, and I held up the Winchester repeater. Here is a hollow staff that shall enable thee to kill, even as we kill. Only I lay this charm upon it. Thou shalt kill no man with it. If thou liftest it against a man, it shall kill thee. Stay, I will show thee. Bid a soldier step forty paces and place the shaft of a spear in the ground so that the flat blade looks towards us. In a few seconds it was done. Now, see, I will break yonder spear. Taking a careful sight, I fired. The bullet struck the flat of the spear and shattered the blade into fragments. Again the sigh of astonishment went up. 
Now, Twala, we give this magic tube to thee, and by and by I will show thee how to use it. But beware how thou turnest the magic of the stars against a man of earth. And I handed him the rifle. The king took it very gingerly and laid it down at his feet. As he did so, I observed the wizened, monkey-like figure creeping from the shadow of the hut. It crept on all fours, but when it reached the place where the king sat, it rose upon its feet, and throwing the furry covering from its face revealed a most extraordinary and weird countenance. Apparently it was that of a woman of great age, so shrunken that in size it seemed no larger than the face of a year-old child, although made up of a number of deep and yellow wrinkles. Set in these wrinkles was a sunken slit that represented the mouth, beneath which the chin curved outwards to a point. There was no nose to speak of. Indeed, the visage might have been taken for that of a sun-dried corpse, had it not been for a pair of large black eyes, still full of fire and intelligence, which gleamed and played under the snow-white eyebrows, and the projecting parchment-colored skull, like jewels in a charnel house. As for the head itself, it was perfectly bare and yellow in hue, while its wrinkled scalp moved and contracted like the hood of a cobra. The figure to which this fearful countenance belonged, a countenance so fearful indeed that it caused a shiver of fear to pass through us as we gazed at it, stood still for a moment. Then suddenly it projected a skinny claw armed with nails nearly an inch long, and laying it on the shoulder of Twala the king, began to speak in a thin and piercing voice. Listen, O king, listen, O warriors, listen, O mountains and plains and rivers, home of the Kukuana race, listen, O skies and sun, O rain, and storm and mist. Listen, O men and women, O youths and maidens, and O ye babes unborn. Listen, all things that live and must die. Listen, all dead things that shall live again, again to die. Listen, the spirit of life is in me, and I prophesy, I prophesy, I prophesy. The words died away in a faint wail and dread seemed to seize upon the hearts of all who heard them, including our own. This old woman was very terrible. Blood! 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 Rivers of blood! Blood everywhere! I see it! I smell it! I taste it! It is salt! It runs red upon the ground! It rains down from the skies! Footsteps! 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 the tread of the white man coming from afar. It shakes the earth, the earth trembles before her master. Blood is good, the red blood is bright. There is no smell like the smell of new-shed blood. The lions shall lap it and roar. The vultures shall wash their wings in it and shriek with joy. I am old. I am old. I have seen much blood, <laughs> but I shall see more ere I die, and be merry. How old am I, think ye? Your fathers knew me, and their fathers knew me, and their fathers' fathers' fathers. I have seen the white man and know his desires. I am old, but the mountains are older than I. Who made the great road, tell me? Who wrote the pictures on the rocks, tell me? Who reared up the three silent ones yonder that gaze across the pit, tell me? And she pointed towards the three precipitous mountains which we had noticed on the previous night. Ye know not, but I know. It was the white people who were here before ye are. Who shall be here when ye are not? Who shall eat you up and destroy you? Yea, yea, yea. And what came they for, the white ones, the terrible ones, the skilled in magic and all learning, the strong, the unswerving? What is that bright stone upon thy forehead, O king? Whose hands made the iron garment upon thy breast, O king? Ye know not, but I know, I the old one, I the wise one, I the Isanusi, the witch doctress. 
Then she turned her bald vulture head towards us. What seek ye, white man of the stars? Ah, yes, of the stars. Do ye seek a lost one? Ye shall not find him here. He is not here. Never for ages upon ages has a white foot pressed this land. Never except once, and I remember that he left it but to die. Ye come for bright stones, I know it, I know it. Ye shall find them when the blood is dry. But ye shall return whence ye came, or shall ye stop with me? <laughs> and thou, thou with the dark skin and the proud bearing, and she pointed her skinny finger at Umbopa, who art thou, and what seekest thou? Not stones that shine, not yellow metal that gleams, these thou leavest to white men from the stars. Methinks I know thee. Methinks I can smell the smell of the blood in thy heart. Strip off thy girdle. Here the features of this extraordinary creature became convulsed, and she fell to the ground, foaming in an epileptic fit, and was carried into the hut. The king rose up trembling and waved his hand. Instantly the regiments began to file off, and in ten minutes, save for ourselves, the king, and a few attendants, the great space was left empty. White people, he said, it passes in my mind to kill you. Gagool has spoken strange words, what say ye? I laughed. Be careful, O king, we are not easy to slay. Thou hast seen the fate of the ox. Wouldst thou be as the ox is? The king frowned. It is not well to threaten the king. We threaten not. We speak what is true. Try to kill us, O king, and learn. The great savage put his hand to his forehead and thought. Go in peace, he said at length. Tonight is the great dance. Ye shall see it. Fear not that I shall set a snare for you. Tomorrow I will think. It is well, O king, I answered unconcernedly, and then, accompanied by Infadus, we rose and went back to our corral. End of chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 10 The Witch Hunt On reaching our tent, I motioned to Infadus to enter with us. Now, Infadus, I said, we would speak with thee. But my lord say on, it seems to us, Infadus, that Twala the king is a cruel man. It is so, my lords. Alas, the land cries out because of his cruelties. Tonight you shall see. It is the great witch hunt, and many will be smelt out as wizards and slain. No man's life is safe. If the king covets a man's cattle or a man's wife, or if he fears a man that he should excite a rebellion against him, then Gagool, whom he saw, or some of the witch-finding women whom she has taught, will smell that man out as a wizard, and he will be killed. Many must die before the moon grows pale tonight. It is ever so. Perhaps I too shall be killed. As yet I have been spared because I am skilled in war and am beloved by the soldiers, but I know not how long I have to live. The land groans at the cruelties of Twala the king. It is wearied of him and his red ways. Then why is it, Enfadus, that the people do not cast him down? Nay, my lords, he is the king, and if he were killed, Scraga would reign in his place and the heart of Scraga is blacker than the heart of Twala, his father. If Scraga were king, his yoke upon our neck would be heavier than the yoke of Twala. 
if Imotu had never been slain, or if Ignosi his son had lived, it might have been otherwise. But they are both dead. How knowest thou that Ignosi is dead? said a voice behind us. We looked round astonished to see who spoke. It was Umbopa. What meanest thou, boy? asked Infadus. Who told thee to speak? Listen, Infadus, was the answer, and I will tell thee a story. Years ago the king Imotu was killed in this country, and his wife fled with the boy Ignosi. Is it not so? It is so. It was said that the woman and her son died upon the mountains. Is it not so? It is even so. Well, it came to pass that the mother and the boy Ignosi did not die. They crossed the mountains and were led by a tribe of wandering desert men across the sands beyond, till at last they came to water and grass and trees again. How knowest thou this? Listen, they traveled on and on, many months' journey, till they reached a land where a people called the Amazulu, who are also of the Kukuana stock, lived by war, and with them they tarried many years, till at length the mother died. Then the son Ignosi became a wanderer again, and journeyed into a land of wonders where white people live, and for many more years he learned the wisdom of the white people. It is a pretty story, said Infadus incredulously. For years he lived there working as a servant and a soldier, but holding in his heart all that his mother had told him of his own place, and casting about in his mind to find how he might journey thither to see his people and his father's house before he died. For long years he lived and waited, and at last the time came, as it ever comes to him who can wait for it, and he met some white men who would seek this unknown land, and joined himself to them. The white men started and traveled on and on, seeking for one who was lost. They crossed the burning desert, they crossed the snow-clad mountains, and at last reached the land of the Kukuanas, and there they found thee, O Infadus. Surely thou art mad to talk thus, said the astonished old soldier. Thou thinkest so. See, I will show thee, O my uncle. I am Ignosi, rightful king of the Kukuanas. Then with a single movement Umbopa slipped off his muka or girdle, and stood naked before us. Look, he said, what is this? And he pointed to the picture of a great snake tattooed in blue round his middle, its tail disappearing into its open mouth just above where the thighs are set into the body. Infadus looked, his eyes starting nearly out of his head. Then he fell upon his knees. Coom, coom! he ejaculated. It is my brother's son. It is the king. Did I not tell thee so, my uncle? Rise, I am not yet the king, but with thy help, and with the help of these brave white men, who are my friends, I shall be. Yet the old witch Gagul was right. The land shall run with blood first, and hers shall run with it, if she has any and can die, for she killed my father with her words, and drove my mother forth. And now, Infadus, choose now. Will thou put thy hands between my hands and be my man? Will thou share the dangers that lie before me, and help me to overthrow this tyrant and murderer? Or will thou not? Choose thou. The old man put his hand to his head and thought. Then he rose, and advancing to where Umbopa, or rather Ignosi, stood, he knelt before him and took his hand. Ignosi, rightful king of the Kukuanas, I put my hand between thy hands, and am thy man till death. 
when thou wast a babe I dandled thee upon my knees. Now shall my old arm strike for thee and freedom. It is well, Infadus. If I conquer, thou shalt be the greatest man in the kingdom after the king. If I fail, thou canst only die, and death is not far off from thee. Rise, my uncle. And ye, ye white men, will ye help me? What have I to offer you? The white stones. If I conquer and can find them, ye shall have as many as ye can carry hence. Will that suffice you? I translated this remark. Tell him, answered Sir Henry, that he mistakes an Englishman. Wealth is good, and if it comes in our way, we will take it. But a gentleman does not sell himself for wealth. Still, speaking for myself, I say this. I have always liked Umbopa, and so far as lies in me, I will stand by him in this business. It will be very pleasant to me to try to square matters with that cruel devil Twala. What do you say, good, and you, Quartermain? Well, said Good, to adopt the language of hyperbole, in which all these people seem to indulge, you can tell that a row is surely good, and warms the cockles of the heart, and that so far as I am concerned, I am his boy. My only stipulation is that he allows me to wear trousers. I translated the substance of these answers. It is well, my friends, said Ignosi, late Umbopa. And what sayest thou, Macumazan? Art thou also with me, old hunter, cleverer than a wounded buffalo? I thought a while and scratched my head. Umbopa, or Ignosi, I said, I don't like revolutions. I am a man of peace and a bit of a coward. Here Umbopa smiled. But on the other hand, I stick up for my friends, Ignosi. You have stuck to us and played the part of a man, and I will stick by you. But mind you, I am a traitor and have to make my living, so I accept your offer about those diamonds in case we should ever be in position to avail ourselves of it. Another thing, we came, as you know, to look for Inkubu, Sir Henry's lost brother. You must help us to find him. That I will do, answered Ignosi. Stay, Infadus, by the sign of the snake about my middle, tell me the truth. Has any white man, to thy knowledge, set his foot within the land? None, O oh, Ignosi. If any white man had been seen or heard of, wouldst thou have known? I should certainly have known. Thou hearest, Inkubu, said Ignosi to Sir Henry. He has not been here. Well, well, said Sir Henry with a sigh. There it is. I suppose that he never got so far. Poor fellow, poor fellow. So it has all been for nothing. God's will be done. Now for business, I put in, anxious to escape from a painful subject. It is very well to be a king by right divine, Ignosi, but how does thou propose to become a king indeed? Nay, I know not, Infadus. Hast thou a plan? Ignosi, son of the lightning, answered his uncle. Tonight is the great dance and witch hunt. Many shall be smelt out and perish, and in the hearts of many others there will be grief and anguish and fury against the King Twala. When the dance is over, then I will speak to some of the great chiefs, who in turn, if I can win them over, will speak to their regiments. I shall speak to the chiefs softly at first, and bring them to see that thou art indeed the king, and I think that by tomorrow's light... Thou shalt have twenty thousand spears at thy command. And now I must go and think, 
and hear and make ready. After the dance is done, if I am yet alive, and we are all alive, I will meet thee here, and we can talk. At best there must be war. At this moment our conference was interrupted by the cry that messengers had come from the king. Advancing to the door of the hut, we ordered that they should be admitted, and presently three men entered, each bearing a shining shirt of chain armor and a magnificent battle axe. "'The gifts of my lord, the king, to the white men from the stars,' said a herald who came with them. "'We thank the king,' I answered. "'Withdraw.' "'The men went, and we examined the armor with great interest. "'It was the most wonderful chain work that either of us had ever seen. "'A whole coat fell together so closely that it formed a mass of links, "'scarcely too big to be covered with both hands.' "'Do you make these things in this country, in Fadus? I asked. "'They are very beautiful.' "'Nay, my lord, they came down to us from our forefathers. "'We know not who made them, and there are but few left.' "'Editor's Note. "'In the Sudan, swords and coats of mail are still worn by Arabs "'whose ancestors must have stripped them from the bodies of crusaders.' None but those of royal blood may be clad in them. They are magic coats through which no spear can pass, and those who wear them are well nigh safe in the battle. The king is well pleased, or much afraid, or he would not have sent these garments of steel. Clothe yourselves in them tonight, my lords. The remainder of that day we spent quietly, "'resting and talking over the situation, which was sufficiently exciting. "'At last the sun went down, the thousand watchfires glowed out, "'and through the darkness we heard the tramp of many feet "'and the clashing of hundreds of spears "'as the regiments passed to their appointed places "'to be ready for the great dance. "'Then the full moon shone out in splendor, "'and as we stood watching her rays, Infadus arrived, clad in his war dress, and accompanied by a guard of twenty men to escort us to the dance. As he recommended, we had already donned the shirts of chain armor which the king had sent us, putting them on under our ordinary clothing, and finding to our surprise that they were neither very heavy nor uncomfortable. These steel shirts, which evidently had been made for men of a very large stature, "'hung somewhat loosely upon Good and myself, "'but Sir Henry's fitted his magnificent frame like a glove. "'Then, strapping our revolvers round our waists "'and taking in our hands the battle-axes "'which the king had sent with the armor, we started. "'On arriving at the great corral, "'where we had that morning been received by the king,' we found that it was closely packed with some 20,000 men arranged round it in regiments. These regiments were, in turn, divided into companies, and between each company ran a little path to allow space for the witch-finders to pass up and down. Anything more imposing than the sight that was presented by this vast and orderly concourse of armed men, it is impossible to conceive. There they stood, perfectly silent, and the moon poured her light upon the forest of their raised spears, upon their majestic forms, waving plumes, and the harmonious shading of their various colored shields. Wherever we looked were line upon line of dim faces surrounded by range upon range of shimmering spears. Surely, I said to Enfadus, the whole army is here. "'Nay, Macumazan, he answered, "'but a third of it. "'One third is present at this dance each year. "'Another third is mustered outside "'in case there should be trouble when the killing begins. Ten thousand more garrison the outposts round Lou, "'and the rest watch at the corrals in the country. "'Thou seest it is a great people.' "'They are very silent,' said Good. 
and indeed the intense stillness among such a vast concourse of living men was almost overpowering. "'What says Bougwan?' asked Infadus. I translated. "'Those over whom the shadow of death is hovering are silent,' he answered grimly. "'Will many be killed?' "'Very many.' "'It seems,' I said to the others, "'that we are going to assist at a gladiatorial show "'arranged regardless of expense. "'Sir Henry shivered, and Good said that he wished we could get out of it. "'Tell me,' I asked Infadus, "'are we in danger?' "'I know not, my lords. I trust not. "'But do not seem afraid. "'If you live through the night, all may go well with you.' THE SOLDIERS MURMUR AGAINST THE KING. ALL THIS WHILE WE HAD BEEN ADVANCING STEADILY TOWARDS THE CENTER OF THE OPEN SPACE, IN THE MIDST OF WHICH WERE PLACED SOME STOOLS. AS WE PROCEEDED, WE PERCEIVED ANOTHER SMALL PARTY COMING FROM THE DIRECTION OF THE ROYAL HUT. IT IS THE KING, TWALA, SCRAGA, HIS SON, AND GAGUL, THE OLD. AND SEE, WITH THEM ARE THOSE WHO SLAY, "'said Infadus, pointing to a little group of about a dozen gigantic and savage-looking men, "'armed with spears in one hand and heavy carries in the other. "'The king seated himself upon the center stool. "'Gagul crouched at his feet, and the other stood behind him. "'Greeting, white lords,' Twala cried as we came up. "'Be seated. Waste not precious time. "'The night is all too short for the deeds that must be done. "'Ye come in a good hour, and shall see a glorious show. "'Look round, white lords, look round.' "'And he rolled his one wicked eye from regiment to regiment. "'Can the stars show you such a sight as this? "'See how they shake in their wickedness, "'all those who have evil in their hearts.' "'and fear the judgment of heaven above. "'Begin, begin,' piped Gagool, in her thin, piercing voice. "'The hyenas are hungry. They howl for food. Begin, begin.' "'For a moment there was intense stillness, "'made horrible by a presage of what was to come. "'The king lifted his spear, "'and suddenly twenty thousand feet were raised.' as though they belonged to one man, and brought down with a stamp upon the earth. This was repeated three times, causing the solid ground to shake and tremble. Then from a far point of the circle a solitary voice began a wailing song, of which the refrain ran something as follows. What is the lot of man born of women? Back came the answer rolling out from every throat in that vast company death. Gradually, however, the song was taken up by company after company, till the whole armed multitude were singing it, and I could no longer follow the words except in so far as they appeared to represent various phases of human passions, fears, and joys. Now it seemed to be a love song, now a majestic swelling war chant, and last of all a death dirge ending suddenly in one heart-breaking wail that went echo and rolling away in a volume of blood-curdling sound. Again silence fell upon the place, and again it was broken by the king lifting his hand. Instantly we heard a pattering of feet, and from out of the masses of warriors strange and awful figures appeared running towards us. As they drew near, we saw that these were women, most of them aged, for their white hair, ornamented with small bladders taken from fish, streamed out behind them. Their faces were painted in stripes of white and yellow. Down their backs hung snake skins, and round their waists rattled circlets of human bones, while each held a small forked wand in her shriveled hand. In all there were ten of them. When they arrived in front of us, they halted, and one of them, pointing with her wand towards the crouching figure of Gagul, cried out, 
Mother, old oh mother, we are here. Good, 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 answered that aged iniquity. Are your eyes keen, Isanusis, witch doctresses, ye seers in dark places? Mother, they are keen. Good, good, good. Are your ears open, Isanusis, ye who hear words that come not from the tongue? Mother, they are open. Good, good, good. Are your senses awake, Isanusis? Can ye smell blood? Can ye purge the land of the wicked ones who compass evil against the king and against their neighbors? Are ye ready to do justice of heaven above, ye whom I have taught, who have eaten of the bread of my wisdom and drunk of the water of my magic? Mother, we can. Then go. Tarry not, ye vultures. See, the slayers, pointing to the ominous group of executioners behind. Make sharp their spears. The white men from afar are hungry to see. Go. With a wild yell, Gagool's horrid ministers broke away in every direction, like fragments from a shell, the dry bones round their waists rattling as they ran, and headed for various points of the dense human circle. We could not watch them all, so we fixed our eyes upon the Isanusi nearest to us. When she came to within a few paces of the warriors, she halted and began to dance wildly turning round and round with an almost incredible rapidity, and shrieking out sentences such as, I smell him, the evil doer. He is near, he who poisoned his mother. I hear the thoughts of him who thought evil of the king. Quicker and quicker she danced, till she lashed herself into such a frenzy of excitement that the foam flew in specks from her gnashing jaws till her eyes seemed to start from her head and her flesh to quiver visibly. Suddenly she stopped dead and stiffened all over, like a pointed dog when he scents game. And then, with outstretched wand, she began to creep stealthily towards the soldiers before her. It seemed to us that as she came their stoicism gave way and that they shrank from her. As for ourselves... We followed her movements with a horrible fascination. Presently, still creeping and crouching like a dog, the Isanusi was before them. Then she halted and pointed, and again crept on a pace or two. Suddenly the end came. With a shriek, she sprang in and touched a tall warrior with her forked wand. Instantly, two of his comrades... Those standing immediately next to him seized the doomed man, each by one arm, and advanced with him towards the king. He did not resist, but we saw that he dragged his limbs as though they were paralyzed, and that his fingers from which the spear had fallen were limp like those of a man newly dead. As he came, two of the villainous executioners stepped forward to meet him, Presently they met, and the executioners turned round, looking towards the king as though for orders. Kill, said the king. Kill, squeaked Gagool. Kill, re-echoed Scraga with a hollow chuckle. Almost before the words were uttered, the horrible deed was done. One man had driven his spear into the victim's heart, and to make assurance double sure, the other had dashed out his brains with a great club. One counted Twala the king, just like a black Madame Defarge, as Good said, and the body was dragged a few paces away and stretched out. Hardly was the thing done before another poor wretch was brought up like an ox to the slaughter. This time we could see, from the leopard-skin cloak which he wore, that the man was a victim of rank, Again the awful syllables were spoken, and the victim fell. Two, counted the king. And so the deadly game went on, till about a hundred bodies were stretched in rows behind us. 
I have heard of the gladiatorial shows of the Caesars and of the Spanish bullfights, but I take the liberty of doubting if either of them could be half so horrible as this Cucuana witch hunt. Gladiatorial shows and Spanish bullfights, at any rate, contributed to the public amusement, which certainly was not the case here. The most confirmed sensation monger would fight shy of sensation if he knew that it was well on the cards that he would, in his own proper person, be the subject of the next event. Once we rose and tried to remonstrate, but were sternly repressed by Twala. Let the law take its course, white men. These dogs are magicians and evildoers. It is well that they should die, was the only answer vouchsafed to us. About half past ten there was a pause. The witch finders gathered themselves together, apparently exhausted with their bloody work, and we thought that the performance was done with. But it was not so, for presently, to our surprise, the ancient woman, Gagool, rose from her crouching position, and supporting herself with a stick, staggered off into the open space. It was an extraordinary sight to see this frightful vulture-headed old creature, bent nearly double with extreme age, gather strength by degrees, until at last she rushed about almost as actively as her ill-omened pupils. To and fro she ran, chanting to herself, till suddenly she made a dash at a tall man standing in front of one of the regiments and touched him. As she did this, a sort of groan went up from the regiment, which evidently he commanded. But two of its officers seized him all the same and brought him up for execution. We learned afterwards that he was a man of great wealth and importance, being indeed a cousin of the king. He was slain, and Twala counted one hundred and three. Then Gagool again sprang to and fro, gradually drawing nearer and nearer to ourselves. "'Hang me if I don't believe she is going to try her games on us!' ejaculated Good in horror. "'Nonsense,' said Sir Henry. "'As for myself, when I saw that old fiend dancing nearer and nearer, my heart positively sank into my boots.' I glanced behind us at the long row of corpses and shivered. Nearer and nearer waltzed Gagool, looking for all the world like an animated crooked stick or comma, her horrid eyes gleaming and glowing with a most unholy luster. Nearer she came, and yet nearer, every creature in that vast assemblage watching her movements with intense anxiety. At last she stood still and pointed. "'Which is it to be?' asked Sir Henry to himself. In a moment all doubts were at rest, for the old hag had rushed in and touched Umbopa, alias Ignosi, on the shoulder. "'I smell him out!' she shrieked. "'Kill him! Kill him! He is full of evils! Kill him! The stranger! Before blood flows from him!' "'Slay him, O king!' "'There was a pause, of which I instantly took advantage. "'O king,' I called out, rising from my seat, "'this man is the servant of thy guests. "'He is their dog. "'Whosoever sheds the blood of our dog sheds our blood. "'By the sacred law of hospitality, I claim protection for him. "'Gagool, mother of the witch-finders, has smelt him out. "'He must die, white men.' was the sullen answer. "'Nay, he shall not die,' I replied. "'He who tries to touch him shall die indeed.' "'Seize him!' roared Twala to the executioners, who stood round red to the eyes with the blood of their victims. They advanced towards us and then hesitated. As for Ignosi, he clutched his spear, and raised it as though determined to sell his life dearly. "'Stand back, ye dogs!' I shouted. "'If you would see tomorrow's light, touch one hair of his head and your king dies.' 
and I covered Twala with my revolver. Sir Henry and Good also drew their pistols, Sir Henry pointing his at the leading executioner who was advancing to carry out the sentence, and Good taking a deliberate aim at Gagool. Twala winced perceptibly as my barrel came in a line with his broad chest. Well, I said, what is it to be, Twala? Then he spoke. Put away your magic tubes, he said. Ye have adjured me in the name of hospitality, and for that reason, but not from fear of what ye can do, I spare him. Go in peace. It is well, I answered unconcernedly. We are weary of slaughter and would sleep. Is the dance ahead? It is ended, Twala answered sulkily. Let these dead dogs, pointing to the long row of corpses, be flung out to the hyenas and the vultures. And he lifted his spear. Instantly the regiments began to defile through the corral gateway in perfect silence, a fatigue party only remaining behind to drag away the corpses of those who had been sacrificed. Then we rose also, and making our salam to his majesty, which he hardly deigned to acknowledge, we departed to our huts. Well, said Sir Henry as we sat down, having first lit a lamp of the sort used by the Cucuanas, of which the wick is made from the fiber of a species of palm leaf and the oil from clarified hippopotamus fat. Well, I feel uncommonly inclined to be sick. If I had any doubts about helping Umbopa to rebel against that infernal blackguard, put in good, they are gone now. It was as much as I could do to sit still while that slaughter was going on. I tried to keep my eyes shut, but they would open just at the wrong time. I wonder where Infadus is. Umbopa, my friend, you ought to be grateful to us. Your skin came near to having an air hole made in it. I am grateful, Bugwan, was Umbopa's answer when I had translated. And I shall not forget... As for Infadus, he will be here by and by. We must wait. So we lit our pipes and waited. End of chapter 10